Jake, he's going to tell you a lot of the things that he has he's accomplished, and he's accomplished some great things. He was a World War II hero. He's got many, many, many honors, presidential honors, uh, just outstanding uh, honors during World War II. If you watch the movie, an old movie called The Dirty Dozen, Jake was the sergeant in the real deal. And when they when they made the jump, and they made the movie, and he can tell you, he can tell you, you know how they change movies a little bit, but he can tell you exactly the way that it really was. And he's got some great, great stories to tell you about D-Day, about World War II, throughout. So we are really excited to have him. And he's going to tell you uh, a lot of things, and then he, I'm sure that he will be glad to answer some questions. There was a book made up about him and a lot of his other fellow soldiers during World War II. Uh, that's him inside with the Mohawk and a lot of the pictures that they made about the actual happenings uh, during this time. Uh, so I'm not going to take any more of his time because we want to utilize every minute we can uh, for him to talk to you. But uh, I think you'll really enjoy today uh, to hear from Jake McNeese. Thank you. Thank you. Is this any better? Can y'all hear this? Yeah. yeah. It is better? Okay. Okay, we'll get this show yeah, on the road right here. Around. If you are in the back of the area and do not understand me, why? signified by raising a hand or something. You come through your mind. Or if you do, or if you're at me and I'm coming through good and you don't like it, you can get up and leave. Okay. <laughs> I went to school out here at, from 37 through 39. I graduated in May of 1941. I played football out here. At that time we had kind of a semi-professional football team. Uh, Jack Baker, the coach, recruited men from four states. We had some good teams out here at that time. I captained a team of 39. We all, I, I was pretty busy with football and I didn't uh, do a whole lot of studying. I didn't know my, my four majors was football, study hall, pool hall, and alcohol. <laughs> and so you'll have to excuse some of the grammar and the English that I use today because it is it is not very good. I, I didn't do so good as a scholar. Uh, I'm Jake McNeese. I was went into the military service in 1942 in September. At that time, our pay scale was $21 a month. That's what you were paying taxes for today, is to reduce that indebtedness so we run up at those terrible high rates of $21 a month. When you stayed in the service for 31 days, most of the times is awful tough at them, you know, and, and most everybody either had wives and children at home or parents that needed help and assistance. And if you were in the Army for 31 days, they generally made you a PFC. That was a private first place. And that increased your salary to $31 a month. And they anticipated then that you probably would uh, send home an allotment to your wife or your kids or your mother and dad or whoever needed it. Uh, by the time I had been in there 31 days, I was in a lot of trouble. I had worked the sergeant and I had been absent from a few formations and this and that. And so I didn't make PFC. I stayed in the service for three years and five months and 26 days. In seven hours and 15 minutes and three seconds and I never made PFC. I was uh, most of the time that I was in the service I was a sergeant of some type in an acting capacity. I either had a group of anywhere from 20 to 40 men under my command or anywhere on up to 150 which was a company on up to uh, a group of volunteers where there was 400 of us that had volunteered for or parachute pathfinding unit. So I was in command of people nearly all the time. I was the sergeant that took the dirty dozen in. The show didn't do it justice at all. The show 
as it depicted it was a bunch of arch criminals that had committed, committed heinous crimes and they were in prison under life or death sentences for rape and murder and that sort of thing. That wasn't true. All the boys that was in the filthy 13 were <coughs> soldiers that I was soldiered with. They were great men. They were a bunch of goofballs and we had been conglomerately, I guess, that we had been in every jail from Rome to Rome and Maine to Spain. But it was not for heinous crimes. It was like stealing the colonel's chief for his whiskey or run all the, the women from an officer's party or just going AWOL for a few days or maybe a week or two weeks. But we never did anything really criminal. So that was an injustice that they portrayed about the group of men that composed the, the filthy 13. They dubbed it the Dirty 12 in the show. I took those boys in on Normandy on D-Day and we had a very suicidal mission and instead of the 13 men that I normally used in a demolition saboteur stick, I took in 20 men all together. Uh, it, was, uh, it was a very, very important mission. We needed to blow up two bridges and hold the third one near Carrington, France, which was a great supply route for the German army to move troops and <coughs> supplies into the beachhead area to combat the invasion. We were very successful in our, in our mission. We accomplished, we flew up the two bridges, held the third one for three days, and then the Air Force decided that we had lost out and we were no longer in control, and so they came in with four P-51s and dive-bombed and knocked the bridge out. We had it wired, had it electrically wired with ammunition, with demolitions that we could have blown at any time we wanted to but they asked us to hold it as long as we could. When the P four P-51s came in, they dived on that bridge, and the second one hit the bridge and destroyed it. Well, at this time in Europe, and when they have, were having so many bombing missions and so many uh, explosives that were on planes and so forth, if a group of planes took off with explosives, with bombs, etc., to destroy a position and so forth after they destroyed it, if they had bombs left or if they had machine gun ammunition or any type of artillery left to fight with it, they were supposed to discharge it on the second mission, second objective. They didn't want them to come back and try to land on the fields with bombs and so forth on the plane. So after they knocked the bridge out with the second, with, on the second run, why they then divided up. They could see us dug in on one end of the bridge and the Germans on the other end, and they thought they were all German. So they divided up. Two planes took the Germans and two took us and dropped the rest of their bombs in on us and then strafed us. On the mission, when I came out of the mission, I went in with 20 men and I came out with two boys. We lost 18 men in there and before daybreak. We jumped in at midnight and by daybreak, what? Well, we had had uh, 16 of the boys killed. But we did accomplish our mission. The, the show was, was totally wrong on mission and on accomplishment. But anyway, that was the first mission that we had in, in France on the invasion when we jumped in at midnight on June the 5th before they hit the beaches the next morning at 6 o'clock. Or am I coming through to y'all at the back of the room now? Are you hearing me? <laughs> we stayed we stayed in fall in, in uh, Normandy for 36 days and uh, we made a pretty good record for ourselves in there. The 506 parachute infantry regiment which I was a member of suffered the heaviest casualties of any regiment in the entire invasion. We lost I think it was 68 percent. And that was all. Uh, that was uh, fairly average and pretty well expected that we would lose any for They hoped we would lose as little as 50 percent on some of our missions, but it never worked out that way. It always ran between 68 and 70 percent on each mission. The average lifetime of a combat paratrooper is one and a half jumps. They don't last very long. You wonder how they come up with a decision on one and a half jumps if two guys jump one of them will be killed. If that one that survives jumps on the next one with another guy, he'll be killed. So
so uh, they think that, that the average, the, the estimated average lifetime of a combat paratrooper is one and a half jump. There was four para, three paratroopers in the 101st Airborne Division that lived through four combat jumps. It was unheard of. And there was three of us that managed to make four combat jumps. I jumped in Normandy on uh, December, on uh, June the 5th on the invasion, stayed there 36 days and fought. And then we came out of there and, and they immediately needed us to make the invasion of Holland. Holland had been occupied, if you are cognizant with the world situation at that time. They had been under occupation for five years. The 101st Airborne and the 82nd Airborne jumped in there ahead of the British 2nd Army under General Dibson. We jumped in there on Sunday afternoon on September the 17th. And we had a very successful mission up there. We fought in, in Holland for 78 days without a change of clothes or a bath or a shave or anything else. And we supplied our own rations that we were eating and living on of just off of the lay of the land. Uh, I have a granddaughter here, and she's attending high school here now, and I think she takes about three showers a day. But we went for 78 days up there in the Holland without a bath or a change of clothes or shave. Uh, we fought there, and on the Hollandish mission, we lost all 72%. We came out of there after 78 days and was pulled back into uh, to France and would be re-equipped and, and get reassignments of men and new replacements. And, of course, at that time it looked like the war was practically over for all practical purposes. They were out of, out of air power. They were out running out of like, gasoline and oil. They were mostly cavalry units. <coughs> And for all practical purposes, it looked like the war was over. Well, I went AWOL when I came back from Holland. I went AWOL. They gave me a 72-hour pass as a reward for being up there fighting for 78 days. And that didn't look rational to me, so they gave me a pass from Camp Mormolon, which was where we were staying, into the city of Mormolon. And the city of Mormolon was a little old town about the size of Ukraine. And you could step one foot in more of the city of Mormolana with the other foot in the camp, and that was where they gave me a pass. So I took off one day wall for several days, and finally came back and reported in. And they came around and asked me how I would like to go to England. <coughs> when they said England, I said, well, that's all right. I said, is that where you decided to hang me is in England? That's good enough. I'll go to England. And they said, oh, they would like for you to volunteer for parachute pathfinding duty. And parachute pathfinding duties was a very serious matter. Uh, they usually lost 80% on each mission. They would be a stick of, of 10 pathfinders that would jump out of a plane with special equipment to guide in other drops and so forth. And they figured they would lose eight out of each 10 men that dropped in. We had, uh, uh, we, they said, would you like to volunteer for parachute pathfinding duty? And I said, if you do, why all charges will be dropped. You'll just go on out here, just a free man. And I got to thinking, well, the pathfinding school was at Shaw Grove Air Force Base, which was only eight miles out of Oxford, <coughs> England. And at Oxford, England, you know, they have the University of Oxford there, one of the biggest universities in Europe. So I got to thinking, well, there's more women and more whiskey and less fight going on right there than any place else in the world. And it would look like that they would never be used for pathfinding services again. And I thought, well, that'd be a uh, wonderful place, you know, to do a bunch of undergraduate work. So I went in, <laughs> I volunteered for pathfinding services, thinking that I would never be used in that. There was five other boys that came around and talked to me, and they said, oh, said, Jake, why would you do a thing like this? And I said, well, I don't think they'll ever use them again. I said, I'm really taking the coward's way out. I said, this, this isn't an act of bravery or heroism. I said, this is the easiest and the best place to be with all the women, all that whiskey, and no fighting going on. And so five others decided they would go with me. 
with my encouragement that, that we would never jump again. We have no more than got back to to Shaw Grove Air Force Base and they called me right straight in and talked to the company commander. And he said I had been recommended to be the first sergeant over this all this group of paratroopers who had volunteered. Every one of them was a goofball, just like myself. That's why they were there. But so were the officers. So I told him that I didn't go for military discipline or courtesies and no salute and no revelries, no retreats, none of that. And he said, well, he said, we can work that. We can arrange that, too. So he made me first sergeant of 400 height finders there on about December the 8th. Well, uh, we had no idea, of course, that the Battle of the Bulge was about to break loose. <coughs> In 19 and 39, Hitler had made the Blitzkrieg across Belgium and Holland and France clear to La Havre. He did it in four days. And this was what he wanted to attempt to do again. And the reason that he was going to do this, if he could make a success of it, that would split the Allied armies, the British and the Americans. And it disrupt all the supply. So, uh, of course, they made the breakthrough on December the 17th. He, he aligned 20 divisions of armor and infantry and parachute people in front of the 106th, the 110th, and the 28th bloody bucket from, from Pennsylvania. He aligned an assault of 20 divisions right in, immediately in front of them and tried to make this bridge creep. When he did, of course, the 106th and the 110th were green troops and they just scattered and went, uh, they went eight and began to retreat and surrender and various other things. You've probably seen the Israels of horror that they were, or the Germans would overrun and take entire companies up to 150 men, young green troops, young boys that had never heard a shot fired or seen a drop of blood. And they would take them and just march them out in the snow covered field and machine gun a whole bunch of them, called it the massacres in, in Marmaduke. And when they, uh, when they did that, of course, the entire American army began to retreat in front of this onslaught. They took the 101st Airborne Division at Mormelon, France, and loaded them into cattle trucks and rushed them into the, to the city of Bastogne. And they gave them orders not to retreat an inch, not to surrender a man, just fight until the 20,000 of them were dead. But they had to hold the city of Mormon. That was the main network of roads and supply routes for the entire Blitz Creek that they were trying to offer. On December the 22nd, I was told to get my stick of pipe finders ready that we were going to jump. Uh, we, when they when we got to the, down to the field of the airstrip, loaded on that C-47, they told me they hand me a little old map with a little circle on it, and they said, that's a bad stone. They said, that's where you will be dropping. And said, the 101st Airborne Division is completely encircled and cut off at the city of Bastogne. Very important network of roads and communication systems. And said, you will absolutely have to drop in there and set up a resupply by air or those men will all be killed immediately. And we took off on the 22nd of December and flew into Bastogne, just flying by the sea of our bridges. It was foggy and rainy and snowy, and I had no idea that they could find Bastogne, and they didn't. We got 65 miles beyond Bastogne before they finally discovered by radio and communication that we were lost. So we circled around and came back out and sat on <coughs> Shaw Road and elected the next day to go in with two plane loads of pipe plane. I would lead the, the first plane and then have a plane of company. And when I dropped out, if they finally got me where they wanted me to go, that they would give me the green light and I would bail out of there and see if we were close to Bastogne. In the event we were, I would throw out orange smoke grenade and they would drop the second stick right on top of us. And by that way, we're having 20 pipe finders in there with six of the CRN force sets. It's what we sent signals with back to the invading forces that we possibly could make it and, and get a signal out. They had 1,000 C-47s loaded with military supplies, gasoline, ammunition, and so forth. 
Ron's going over to France waiting to see if we could get a signal out to We jumped in there at 9.30 in the morning and made it in. They, they did a great job. They, they, the perimeter around Bastogne, of course, was solid with, with paratroopers fighting Germans at 150 yards off. And they dropped us right between. We landed about 75 yards in front of the Germans and about 75 yards from the American line. We were very fortunate. They dropped us right by a huge cemetery. And most of the people there are Catholic or Lutheran, and they have the huge monuments in stone. And we were able to get into that cemetery and use it as cover to get on in. We got on in, and by 9.30, we had made contact with the 1,000 planes who were loaded with supplies circling over France. When we got over the signal to them, they immediately began to hone in on us. And by that evening, by sundown, we had brought in 669 plane loads of ammunition and gasoline and medicine and food and all the things that we needed. We ran the supply for three days, and in the three days that we were there, we brought in 892 plane loads of, of stuff. When that was, of course, after we, uh, General McCullough had a, a couple of German officers come in under a white flag on the 23rd and I offered him an ultimatum to either surrender the entire circle. We just had a two mile diameter. And he offered him the ultimatum that he would either surrender the total mass of the division or that they would be annihilated within two hours by artillery and, and bombardments and things of that work. And said this isn't the American disposition to sacrifice as many people for a lost cause. Said there's no way that you can, can hold that. And of course McCullough standing there, he um, he just didn't uh, know what to do in an exasperation. He said, well, I'm nuts. And one of the officers, <laughs> one of the German officers said, what does that mean, nuts? And the, the Colonel Johnson that was right there with him said, I'll tell you what it means. It means that uh, you better get out of here within three minutes or we'll kill the both of you. Get out as quick as you can. Uh, ultimatum is absolutely refused in its entirety. Uh, when the public would not surrender, then the next morning they came in by aircraft and by artillery and they fired in a, a Jillian leaflets. It showed a picture of a soldier with a bullet through his helmet and the blood gushing out, and a little girl about four years old looking at him saying, Daddy. And then on the other side, now this is all in color too. This is how. how equipped they were with their propaganda and it was in color this whole thing was about like a type uh, page sheet of typewriting paper and on the back side of it it said in beautiful lettering and so forth it said the yuletide the christmas time the, the mistletoe all things that are near and dear to you are just 300 yards ahead goodwill on earth and peace toward man or something to that effect you know, trying to get each one of the individual paratroopers to come on in and surrender since the officers would not there was not a paratrooper that went forward to surrender they had seven divisions that had from us they had four infantry and three armor and we have a, does, does anyone here know uh, dr kurt yeary he's been a physician here for ever since the war he had been captured there at Bastogne. He was uh, a prisoner until the end of the war, but not a man came out of there at all and surrendered. We fought again for another four or five days, and then the fourth armor from the third armor, third army came in and drove a wedge, a wedge into us, and they began to resupply us with troops and otherwise. But the 101st Airborne Division is the only division in military history that was ever awarded. The Presidential Unit Citation of a Division Unit is the only one that ever was or ever will be, I suppose. We had a, we had a great division. We went from there. I, after I came out of that, that was my third combat jump, and that was two times what the average was expectancy, and came back, and they scattered the 101st Airborne Pathfinders up and down behind the front line when they made the big drive across Vermont and Bridge had to be used. And they left me in reserve with all 
but nicely because each of us had three combat jobs. But in the confusion and everything, the 90th Division got cut off in the middle of the Siegfried Line and Prune German. And they gave me orders to jump into them and make my first, fourth combat jump on to get the date. It was an impossibility to believe to begin with, but we did it on February, Friday the 13th. And so <laughs> if you're suspicious, if you believe in number and chronology, that's a bad, bad time to try to make a fourth jump. We made a fourth jump in there and returned and uh, got back to normal service. And Colonel Sink, the reason that they encouraged men to go into pathfinding service was because they really wanted to get them healed. They lost eight out of every ten men on their remission. So that was why they gave me the big opportunity to volunteer for it. We'd like to see me killed. Five other men went with me, and when we came back and got out of there, none of us had been killed on the jump at Bastogne. Colonel Sink sent a, a cablegram in <laughs> to my company commander over the pipeline the unit and said, send those six men back to me. He said, I think I can kill them quicker here than you can over there. <laughs> And the company commander of the headfinder said, I'll send five of them back, but says, I'm going to keep McNeese because said, he's essential to our operation. And I was the one that this trying to get rid of all the time. We had a, we had a, a great war, and it was, absolutely, it was absolutely essential that it be done. We had a madman, Hitler, and his cohorts that were trying to capture the entire world and enslave it. So we had a just cause to fight the type of war that we did. I would like to say this now and let you be aware that, that never did I see an uh, uh, American unit under the control of officers commit an atrocity of war. You saw all of the units do it, but you never saw that happen with the Americans. Of course, you can't, you can't go out and conscript and craft. 8 million men without there being some of them in there that are capable of committing individual atrocities, which did happen. But never an organized atrocity was committed by the United States government. I don't know whether you're aware of it or not, but nearly 400,000 American men were killed in the war. And there was multiple times after people who were disabled and are still walking around on the streets today. Uh, I want you to be sure and aware of this, that all the privileges and liberties and the freedoms that you enjoy in this nation have been paid for by thousands of lives and millions of gallons of blood. If any of you have uncles or aunts or uncles or any relative that has served in any of the services of this nation at one time, please drop them a card of thanks. They'll appreciate it. Uh, the, uh, the, Two major airborne divisions, the two major airborne divisions that were in Europe was the 101st Airborne and the, and the 82nd Airborne. And they all, uh, uh, the, what, Hill? Would you type Here, Here's a book, it's a pictorial book, and it has pictures of nearly all of the 30 dozen in it. They're demarked by two pieces of paper there. And you just pass that around and don't keep it long, just keep it going. And you can look at those pictures. Most of those boys, the 18 boys that have pictures in there and so forth, those pictures were taken about 5 o'clock of the evening of the invasion, the day before the invasion. And in five hours, they were, a lot of them were dead. Only two, only three of us saw the sun come up, the rest of them were killed that evening. Uh, the, uh, the 101st Airborne was known as the Springman Eagles. We wear a patch on our shoulder of our national bird's head. And we called ourselves the Springman Eagles, the 101st Airborne. There was lots of competition and, and between the two divisions, and they called us the Pukin Buzzards. They had the AA on theirs that meant All-American. And we said that that meant Almost Airborne. But they were great troops, they, they did commendable jobs, and, and they represented themselves and this nation real well all through the war. At the close of the war, at the, 
after the Battle of the Bulge, the war was practically over. And they started moving the 101st Airborne Unit south with shock troops to root out the SS boys, the, the elite soldiers. They moved the 82nd Airborne north toward Frankfurt to take care and be in charge of the war crimes trials that were just in the coming in the near future. They all, uh, they, they never, ever was satisfied that the Germans were not. You hear, you hear the media now, the newspapers and, and, and all, your radio and TV and so forth that were behind the Holocaust and say it didn't happen. It did happen, don't believe otherwise. They have thousands of pictures of hundreds of thousands of Jewish and slave labor people being murdered and killed. When we were going into the city of Landsbruck, Germany, as we were fighting south of shock troops, we went into the area that was called Landsbruck. That is the place where Hitler, you know, Hitler was in prison for a couple of years when he was a younger man. He started out as a wallpaper a hanger and a painter. And the idiot went on up and finally took over the entire nation. The world of Europe. But uh, that is where he wrote his book, Mein Kampf. As we were driving in and pushing the Germans back and back and back, they all, they elected to uh, to destroy a concentration camp that they had there. And we heard thousands of rounds of small arm fire, machine gun fire, then individual shots, then you could hear grenades going off. Then you saw a black column of smoke rise up. They had took those people and marched them out in a big area like you would have heard a cattle and machine gun them and killed them with rifles and grenades, and then they poured gasoline and oil on the rest of them and set them on fire that were alive and living. And you could pick out families. You could pick out a family huddled together, be a man, woman, maybe two children. So these things did happen, and that is, that is the proof, and do not be swayed by the media that you're hearing now. They're trying to cover it up. The, uh, we had a lot of fun in paratroops uh, service, I did. Did immensely. We all uh, we had some very tough, hard times, and we were our rations were terrible. Our feed was such that it would make you mad enough to kill anything that you ever come in contact with. But we fed ourselves mostly. We butchered there before we went. We killed the king's deer and his his uh, all of his rabbits and anything else we could find to eat. We stripped gardens wherever we found. Them. So we had we had a real enjoyable time. We had some very tough times. They had uh, they had a, a dedication in November down at Tacoa, Georgia, to the put up a big plaque there to Colonel Singer. He was one of the, he commanded the first parachute regiment that ever came as a regiment, and they were a, a good bunch of men. We have a difficult time in training service. We had men killed in our training, in our physical training. Young men, 17, 18 years old. You don't know what it's like. <coughs> a regular army group of, of infantry people, they will move them up within probably 30 miles of the front. And they see a bunch of hospitals and ambulances and this and that. After a week, they move them up another five miles and you might begin to see the wounded being handled and pinned. <coughs> a week later, they'll move them up another five miles to the front, and then they begin to encounter artillery fire and so forth. And they begin to see dead bodies and carcasses all over with Americans and Germans. And they acclimate them in this fashion. With a paratrooper, this is not possible. You're flying along in planes, and you've never killed a person. You've never heard a shot fired or seen a drop of blood in actual combat. And you're flying along in this plane. And their their fire, the ground fire is coming through the plane, killing men on either side of them. Or you see a plane next to you that will go down, burst in the plane, go down with 20 or 30 paratroopers in it. When you fly in and you get the green light to go and you drop out of that airplane, they're just a bunch of fuzzy faced kids that hardly shave that are 18, 19, 20 years old. And in six seconds, it takes you six seconds to get from the door of that plane to the ground. 
and in six seconds you become one of the world's most professional killers. Uh, a large percentage of casualties and lives and so forth depend upon the success of an airborne invasion. So you have to kill everything between you and your objective once you get on the ground. These people in France where we jumped in have been marrying and intermarrying with German soldiers for years. And some of them had children. So any time that they use this ploy and tactic of putting women and children and elderly people in your path, you had to go ahead and kill everything that was there, whether it was a child, whether it was a woman, or whether it was an old man or an old lady. Because the success of your operation depended on saving the lives of thousands of other soldiers in that area. So you become in six seconds from being just a fuzzy faced kid to the world's most professional kill. We had